Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for coming today evening. And I will speak on the Bhagavad Gita, 11th chapter. I will speak on the theme of how God acts in the world. So, most of us when we function in the world, we go through our day-to-day -day routines and we have certain plans. I'll do this and then this will happen. And I'll do that and that will happen. And in general, we don't think too much about the big picture. But sometimes things don't happen the way we want them to. And then we start thinking what's going on. So normally we eat food and we get energy. But suppose we eat food and don't get energy. Then we realize, hey, something else is going on over here. Maybe something is wrong with my digestion. The only time we think about our digestion is when it doesn't work. So similarly, the only time we think about the bigger picture is when things don't work the way we want them to. Just like when if I'm using a computer to send an email. I really, or if I'm sending, sending a, using a phone to send a message. I really don't think about the phone much unless the phone doesn't stop working. So we all have, we all perceive the world at different levels. So normally a phone is simply, we have a low resolution picture of the phone. Like you can have a high resolution picture of, of something very clear. Low resolution is just outlines. So for us, normally, we function with a low resolution picture of a phone. That is, it's a device to send messages and a device to make a call. But then when it we send a message and the message doesn't go, and then we focus on it. And then we understand this phone is a universe in its own complexity. And sometimes we may have to pay a lot of money to a specialist to try to get the phone fixed. So, so right now I'm speaking and as long as the sound system works, I won't even notice it. It's only when sound system doesn't work, then I start fiddling with it. It is the switch not on, is the volume not adequate, or what's wrong? And when I try to figure out what's wrong, that's the time when I start realizing how complex things are. So normally, we function with a low resolution picture of things. And that applies to people also. Say if we are at a at a shopping mall and then we give, give some money and they give a bill. Now for us, we have a very transactional view of that person. Psychologists have done some experiments and they found that say while the person gives maybe the money and then they get the maybe they give the card and the card is swiped so in between while they give the card what happens is the patient the person at the other side is just dug down and another person comes up over there and 90 percent of the people don't even notice that the person has changed even if it, what happens because for the as long as that person does what is expected we don't really focus on that person so we have a low resolution picture of things, usually. Low resolution means as long as we are able, as long as the thing does what it is expected to do. We focus on it as a tool. But when the thing stops doing what it is meant to do, that's when high resolution. What, what is this? Why isn't it working? So similarly for us, for us the world we also have a low resolution picture of the world. As long as things happen the way we expect them to, we don't really focus on the world. We don't think about the world. We don't think about the nature of reality, the structure of reality. And we, don't, we hardly ever think about the ultimate reality. So the idea is that while we are in the world and things are going on more or less according to our plan, there is very little reason for anyone to think about God. The idea is, we have a low resolution picture. Okay, I want to do this, I want to do this, and this is how I'll do it. 
and now this low resolution picture is not necessarily bad so right now if i were constantly conscious of the the mic then my attention will be focused on the mic and i wouldn't be able to think about what i am meant to speak so we have only finite brain capacity and in that finite brain capacity we can only think about certain number of things so therefore we have a low resolution picture of most things and especially things that are important that's what the zoom in the zoom and then we have a high resolution picture of those things so with this background let's look at how we view god that for most people god doesn't matter so much unless things stop working in their lives i saw uh, a ad of a insurance company they said if you haven't insured with us it's time to say your prayers <laughs> now that means that oh if this is not going to work if you don't have insurance the things are going to fall apart then we'll have to pray to god so the idea is as long as things work in our life we don't really think about the nature of ultimate reality and of course the ultimate reality the highest manifestation is the divine is god is krishna so when we operate with this low resolution picture of things then we most of the times don't think about god and in fact if we consider the various species in the world the animals don't even have the capacity to think about god their vision and their comprehension are all entirely functional biologically speaking animals are driven primarily by survival and reproduction the drives which by which they function and we could have something more pain avoidance pleasure seeking but it's primarily survival and and reproduction and the vedic scriptures talk about this as ahara nidra bhai maithunam that for survival we need food we need defense we need rest and for reproduction we need some some partner some mate so these are the primary things by which the primary functions activities that animals do and they have a functional vision of things now function a low resolution vision is not necessarily unintelligent even a low resolution vision requires intelligence so for a bird when it has to build a nest it requires intelligence to build a nest but it won't ask the question okay where did where did the straws ultimately come from now what is the purpose of life so when we have a low resolution vision of things we don't think about the ultimate content ultimate reality see when life we think of life as oh i want to achieve this i want to gain this i want to enjoy this i want to read this i want to watch this and all that is all that make you some pleasure but what is it ultimately meant for as long as life offers us the routine pleasures then they deaden us to the need for inquiry anything higher and thus we end up as long as things are working in our lives we feel what is the need for an ultimate reality and traditionally human life was considered in a dharmic context to be driven by four drives dharma artha kama and moksha so dharma is is not just religion it is actually harmonious living it is religion is a way by which we live in harmony with reality and when there is harmonious living then there is artha there is prosperity so when we say for example if we are working at a job if we do our duty then we get paid so dharma leads to artha now artha leads to kama kama is not just lust kama is basically fulfillment of desires so when we we do dharma we get artha 
we get resources, we get prosperity, with that we can fulfill our desires. And this is what most people live for. But after some time, see, most people don't get artha and can't fulfill their karma. And they are striving more and more and more for that. When can I get more wealth? How can I fulfill more of my desires? But after some time, some people start realizing that life is frustrating not just because I don't get artha and karma, but because even getting artha and karma doesn't bring fulfillment. And even if I get wealth and even if I fulfill my desires, it's, it's a big irony in life that fulfilling our desires doesn't bring fulfillment to our heart. Like, I fulfill this desire, then 100 other desires come up. I fulfill those desires, then 1000 other desires come up. So, it doesn't bring fulfillment. That is when a person starts seeking moksha. Is there something higher than this? Is there something more to life? So, the pursuit of artha and karma, that is what is today's society, is what we could call the rat race. And there's one big problem with the rat race. Many, but the one big problem is that even if you win the rat race, you still remain a rat. Nothing essentially changes in life. That our desires don't change. The, most people are concerned with increasing the standard of living. That's fine. But more important is to, to raise our standard of longing. What is it that we seek in our life? What is it that we live for? So, even with respect to life, if we consider dharma, artha, kama, moksha. Now, in the western world especially, there is artha to a good extent. And people have the resources to fulfill their desires. So what has happened, there is only artha and kama and dharma and moksha are forgotten. People feel there is no need for any religion and what ultimate liberation. If at all there is liberation, we don't need any spiritual liberation, we will get technological liberation. We, get, we develop technology and then we will be free from all limitations. So the idea here is that we function with a low resolution picture of the world. And in this low resolution picture of the world, as long as the world provides us abundant resources for fulfilling our desires, we don't think beyond the world. We don't think about any reality bigger than or beyond the world. And that's why, while there is atheism, there is also another ideology which is called apathism. But I, I once gave a class in London on, I was supposed to give a class on does God exist. So then the, the, the organizers over there told, told, or they told me change this topic. This, this is an interest people. It says, if God exists, so what? <laughs> The idea is, okay, God exists, God doesn't exist. How does that make any difference for me? So when we have a functional vision of looking at things, then uh, the idea is, in my low resolution picture of the world, how does God matter? God doesn't matter at all. So, so when we have this low resolution picture, and somehow the more material facilities we have, the more life seems to be going the way we want it to go. The, the more we lose impetus to get a high resolution picture. I hope this word low resolution and high resolution are clear. Low resolution is just a gen generic picture. High resolution is we look clearly, deeply, incisively. So a low resolution picture is okay, I achieve money, I get this job, I get this relationship, I get this house, I get this, I'll be happy. That, that's a low resolution picture. Now, we don't need to question it because everybody else is doing it and we feel if I do it, I'll become happy. So, in this low resolution picture, how do we see God or how does God matter at all? So, the, the idea is the Bhagavad Gita's 11th chapter, as I said, I'll speak on that. The Bhagavad Gita's 11th chapter is where Krishna displays the universal form. And in this universal form, what is he displaying? He is displaying how the whole universe is contained within him. Anantam namadhyam punastavadim 
पश्या विश्वेश्वर विश्व रूपा अर्जुन सेज आई एम सींग दिस मैग्निफिसेंट फॉर्म इज नो बिगिनिंग नो मिडिल नो एंड इट इज इट इज आई अंडरस्टैंड इन यूनिवर्सल फॉर्म एंड आई ऑफर ओबेसेंस टू यू हु आर विश्वेश्वर यू आर द लॉर्ड ऑफ द यूनिवर्स एंड यू आर डिस्प्लेइंग दिस फॉर्म सो ऑल ऑफ अस देयर आर टाइम्स इन आवर लाइफ व्हेन we are jolted out of the lord resolution picture say right say now of course you have a small community here but uh, now most of you know each other but suppose you went for a big program somewhere and you didn't know the people next to you now if you were interested in the class you wouldn't really you might just look at the other person maybe greet them not not at them and you would focus on their talk but suppose the person sitting next to you suddenly now all of you are sitting here and all of you are reasonably confident that the person sitting next to you isn't going to suddenly turn at you and slap you in the face now hypothetically why say that's possible now if somebody suddenly slap you then from a low resolution picture which is another person attending this class to a high resolution picture, who are you what are you doing is it so when things suddenly stop happening the way we want them to happen when somebody doesn't behave the way we want them to behave that we expect them to behave that's when we shift from a low resolution picture to a high resolution picture so similarly when our life seems to suddenly be upended things just seem to go wrong that's when we get jolted out of our of our low resolution picture of life and start thinking what's going on what is going on what's this i remember one of my earliest memories of god was that now when some of you will notice i need crutches for walking so when i was one i got polio so my parents dutifully took me to doctor and gave the vaccine but somehow the doctor messed up the dosage of the vaccine and the vaccine instead of preventing polio gave me polio and i do notice that you know i couldn't walk or run like my other like other kids so sometimes my relatives would come and meet my parents and they would talk and i would overhear and you know we all have we we from pious brahmin family so we had altar at our home and we would go and fold our, i was also as a childhood i was taught child so i got to go and bow before god but i didn't think much my first memory is that my one of my relatives and my father, mother were discussing and my mother was saying so i was since my early childhood i was good at studies so my mother said that now what god has taken away from him in physical ability god has given him in intellectual ability so when i heard that For the first time, I heard thinking, "Who is this being God, who has such absolute power to take anything and give anything?" So, so we are just going normally through life. It is at some when sometimes when things don't go the way they are supposed to go, that's when oh, what is going on here? So Krishna also says that one of the categories of people who come to him, four categories, which are the four categories. especially in kaliyuga there are four categories those who are distressed those who are distressed those who are distressed and those who are distressed krishna <laughs> gives four categories but in today's world if somebody is inquisitive so they will just google something up and they will not come to god for it if somebody is needing needing money they will just go and take a loan from a bank they will not come to god so it is distress and especially into one of the biggest distresses that brings people to god today is emotional distress psychological distress that's what mm. so people who are distressed there was a new york times article that how christianity especially evangelical christianity has rebranded god traditionally god was seen as a cosmic supplier that's why we had the prayer o father thou art in heaven hallowed be thy name give us our daily bread so for many people today especially in the western world that prayer has become irrelevant 
most people are not worried about their daily bread. They may be worried about their daily butter. <laughs> but not so much about daily bread. So God, the need of God as a cosmic supplier is not felt. You know, we have welfare states or we have other arrangements. We will get food. Don't starve. So God, in the past, starvation was, even now in many parts of the world, but where starvation was a real major concern for people, then the idea of a God as a cosmic supplier was very relevant. But now that idea is not so relevant. So many of many evangelical churches have rebranded God not as a cosmic supplier but as a cosmic therapist. That you go to God and you will have peace of mind. Your emotional issues will be healed. Your hurts will go away. And people are attracted by that. So the idea is again when things are not going the way we want them to go. At that time we are forced to look at a high resolution picture. And if we look at even our scriptures, for Arjuna, he had come for a war. And when he, now Arjuna, of course, loved Krishna, and they were, he at one level knew that Krishna is God, but he also knew Krishna as a friend. So at the start of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna, at least at that point, had a functional vision of Krishna as my charioteer and as my friend. So it does, he says, Please take my chariot in between the two armies so that I can see who are the warriors assembled on the opposite side to fight with me. And then at that time, when he sees how it's his own relatives. His father figures, his grandfather figures, and his people who are his cousins, they're all assembled to fight him. He says, I don't want to fight like this. I don't want to be a part of this fratricide war. I don't want to cause such a bloodshed. But if I don't fight, then I'll be killed. My brothers will be killed. So what do I do? So when things just he could see things are not going the way I want them to. That's when he turned toward Krishna. And he didn't just turn toward Krishna, he submitted to Krishna. He had a high resolution picture. Krishna is not just my friend, Krishna is my guide. And he's not just my guide, he's my supreme guide. Krishna is my guru and not just the guru, he's the Jagat Guru. Krishna Mande Jagat Guru. And when he had a high resolution picture of Krishna, then Krishna not only revealed spiritual knowledge to him, but Krishna also revealed his universal form to him. So for us, when we face difficulties, we can get frustrated. Why is this happening the way like this? Why is that happening like that? Why is that happening like that? And that's okay. It's understandable to get frustrated at times in life. But instead of simply getting frustrated, we can see the frustration as an opportunity to get a higher resolution picture of things. He says, when our computer stops working, I have so many things to do, and why is my computer not working? It's understandable. But then, if, if we want to regularly work with computers, then it's good to have at least some knowledge of how computers work. You know, I, okay, if I just know enough, I press a key over a keyboard over here, and this gets typed over there. That's good. But... If you're going to regularly work, then you need to know, okay, this is the power supply, this is the motherboard, this is this, this is that. Some, some knowledge more than a low resolution picture is useful. So we may or may not work with computers, but we are constantly working in this world. And we need more than a functional knowledge of the world. We need a high resolution picture of the world. And that's why if you see the 10th and 11th chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, they talk primarily about how to see God in this world. Unless somebody is very interested in and devoted to God, they don't normally think about God directly. Srila Prabhupada writes in, uh, in the book On the Way to Krishna, says, all knowledge comes from God, but all knowledge doesn't begin from God. Begin with God. That means, whatever knowledge whoever has, it's coming from God. It is God giving that knowledge to them. But it's not that suddenly one day people wake up and think, oh, I want to think about God today. 
No, it's our knowledge begins from the world around us. And then we look at the sky and we think, oh, where do the skies come from? And we look at the nature and beauty and think, oh, where did all this come from? So our knowledge begins from the world and sometimes from the world, while we have a low resolution picture of the world, and we seek a high resolution picture. That's when we start thinking of God. So the point I'm making over here is that when frustrations are there in life, often they are impetuses for us to get a higher resolution picture of the world. And we may or may not work with computers regularly, but we are going to function in the world regularly. And to function in the world regularly, when things don't go our way, uh, the way we plan, the way we desire, at that time, we can get frustrated or we can seek a higher resolution picture of things. Now, some people believe that there is no higher resolution picture of things at all. There was an existentialist philosopher, Alvaro Ducamo, he said that life is suffering. Which is, okay, this is true. Bhagavad also says that. But he said, life is suffering. Therefore, the only philosophical question worth asking is, whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow. Life is suffering and there is no higher meaning. The idea there is no higher resolution picture. So this is just what life is. And that is a very nihilistic way of looking at things. And how do we know for sure there is no higher resolution picture of things? In fact, all advancement of knowledge is by looking at, by looking for a higher resolution picture of things. That what do I mean by higher resolution picture of things in general? Scientific knowledge comes by looking for a higher resolution picture of things. When I had gone to Cambridge to speak on science and spirituality, at that time we passed by the tree, same tree where Newton is said to have seen the fruit falling. Now that tree is still being preserved and celebrated as a pilgrimage place for scientists. And there people go and you know, they meditate. How brilliant was Newton that he saw just one apple falling. And some people say the apple fell in front of him. Some people say the apple fell on him. Wherever. But this is an ordinary event. Now imagine instead of Newton, at that time a monkey was there. <laughs> and the monkey had seen the fruit, the apple fall. What would the monkey have done? Because it had not gone its way. <laughs> now Newton could also have done that. But he asked the question. What made this apple fall? And that question. Now it's his brilliance that from that question. came the, He came up with the theory of gravity. But simultaneously. What is important to understand is. That actually. He. For, he asked that question. What makes this apple fall? That means that question indicates that maybe there is some deeper principle of operating over here. And he was looking for a higher resolution picture of the simple act of the falling of apple. A normal resolution, yeah, apples fall. When they fall, we eat them. Or sometimes we throw stones at them, we make them fall, and then we eat them. But, okay, what makes apples fall? So when we seek a higher resolution picture of things, that's when knowledge advances. Scientific knowledge also is, okay, the things are happening this way, but what's making it happen this way? We look for a higher resolution picture of things. So that same principle of looking at a higher resolution picture of things, when we apply it to understand the nature of reality, that's when we can perceive God in the world. And now, so this is when we look at a, try to look at a higher resolution picture of things. So then the question comes up, okay, some people say that God is the ultimate controller. Okay, God is the ultimate controller, God is the supreme controller. So then, if we say, we see bad things happen in the world, one of the oldest philosophical questions is, why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, where was I? I think I was in Canada, and one maybe a six-year-old boy came to me. Why do bad things happen to good people? When somebody asks a question like this, usually you, know, you need to know where they are coming from. So I asked him, what happened? He said, today morning I was eating my milk and biscuit 
and my biscuit fell into the milk and dissolved. Why do bad things happen to good people? <laughs> that was his idea. <laughs> So now, it would be nice if that were the only bad thing that happened, you know, biscuits falling into, into milk. But this is a question which everyone faces. Now when this question comes up, if we say God is the ultimate control, then, then the question comes up, is God doing it? Are all the bad things in the world also done by God? What do you think? Say, we have the Ramayana, we have the Mahabharat. In the Ramayana, uh, Ravan abducts Sita. That's a terrible thing. Now, is actually Ram doing it or Ravan doing it? It's Ravan doing it. So then, so when is everything that happens, is it God doing it? If he is not, then how exactly is the supreme controller? So what am I trying to do over here now is, we are trying to get a high resolution picture of how things happen in the world. Till now I was talking about how we need a high resolution picture and often we seek a high resolution picture and things don't go the way they want, we want them to go. So one way is that when bad things happen to good people. Okay, that's not how it should happen. So then what makes bad things happen? So uh, one low resolution picture is you know, it's my actions. I do things and I get the results. But sometimes I do good things and I get bad results. Why does that happen? Another resolution, low resolution picture could be that you know, God does everything. Well, then does God do evil things? Does, that also doesn't make sense. That's also, you could say that's a religious vision, but that's also a low resolution vision. We're not really asking hard questions. So the Bhagavad Gita explains that a high resolution picture of things means that when things happen, there are three factors over there. There is God's will, there is free will, and there is evil. God's will, free will, and evil. So God's will is supreme. But supreme means isn't God's God is the supreme controller, but not the sole controller. He is the Parameshwar, but we are also Ishwar. And He has given all of us free will. And based on our past karma, we have all different areas over which we can use free will. Here I'll make a certain differentiation between free will and freedom. See, everyone has free will. Even prisoners in jail have free will. But do they have freedom? No. So freedom is the capacity to exercise free will freely. The capacity over which we can exercise our freedom. Maybe a prisoner in a cell can only walk, move within the area of the cell. They don't have much physical freedom. So, just as the prisoner is put in that situation of restricted movement because of, say, past misuse of their freedom. So, everybody has free will, but not everybody has the same degree of freedom. So, for example, if I get angry, I might yell at someone. But if the president of America gets angry, he might just press a few buttons and a whole country might explode because of a nuclear weapon. So, so what has happened is, for the president of America, the area over which they have power is much bigger. So, this is in Sanskrit called as Kshetra. Kshetra is the sphere of control. So we all, by our past karma, have been given a certain amount of kshetra, certain area of control. And what we do within that area of control is up to us. Now God doesn't intervene within it. God is still the supreme controller because we won't have that sphere of control forever. We'll have it for a few years and even that sphere of control is never unlimited. Say somebody is a dictator, somebody is a tyrant. They might just, uh, they might just destroy and kill and pillage, but they can do it maybe for a few years. Now, why can they do it for a few years? Because that's the time when they have been given by their karma that sphere of control for that much time. 
So when things happen, at one level, God's will is the ultimate cause, but it's also free will that is the cause. And what is done by people, by their free will, cannot be ascribed to God's will. If I do something wrong, I can't say that I did wrong and it's God who is doing it. No, it's not God doing it, it's a shaitan who is doing it. Then what is this? What the third thing I said? God's will, free will and evil. Now evil in the Abrahamic religions is personified as Satan. So now Satan or the devil or shaitan or whatever be the tradition, the name we use for it. They use, but the idea in the bhakti tradition is there is no specifically evil being who is prompting us to towards bad things. There is Maya, but Maya is more of a stern teacher. She is not evil. I was in Australia and somebody asked a question that if God wants us to do good things, God wants us to make good choices, then why are the bad options so many and the good options so few? answered, that's how it is in every multiple choice exam. <laughs> Five options, four of them are wrong. Now, the student could sue the teacher. He said, the student can say, you have four wrong options. The probability of my choosing wrong is 80%. How can I get 40% and pass? You are to be blamed for it. No, but the student's choice is not based on probability. The student's choice is meant to be based on education. So, so, so the Maya is like the examiner. So Maya gives us many wrong options. But Maya is not evil. The teacher is not evil. The teacher wants to test the student so that the student can get elevated to a higher standard. So evil is simply in the in the Dharmic traditional understanding, evil is basically the impressions that are stored in our mind which become very strong by repeated indulgence. Just like say if you consider some impurity like lust or anger or greed or envy. Now I have a question for all of you. Is lust, uh, is lust or greed or anger or whatever, if they, let's consider anger. Is anger a desire or a thing? Or don't let's forget anger. Is anger an emotion or a object? Emotion. Okay, okay, agree. And now, okay, let's consider say desire. Maybe it could be it could be lust, it could be craving, somebody's addicted. Now, is addiction a desire? Or is it a thing? It's a desire. But is that all it is? It's definitely a desire. Please imagine if two, if one, two people are staying in one place. And the, both of them go, say two students, they go for school over here. And one of them has never taken any drugs. And in between them, maybe there's a drug joint somewhere. So now the other has taken drugs several times. It's almost hooked to it. So now when both of them pass by, the first student may not even notice that there's a drug joint to it. The other student, let's go and eat, let's go and eat, let's go and eat, let's go and eat. Now at one level it's a desire, but it's not just a desire. There's an impression stored over there because of which the desire comes again and again and again. So it's like say if you use a computer browser. Now suppose somebody has visited a particular website, say maybe Bollywood.com. They have visited that many times. Everybody knows Bollywood. Bollywood is the Indian movie industry. And if you don't know, you've not missed anything. <laughs> <laughs> Bollywood is the Indian counterpart of Hollywood. So we are in California, so I'm sure nobody can be that transcendental to not know Hollywood. <laughs> So anyway, so somebody has visited Bollywood repeatedly, Bollywood.com repeatedly. And then they come for a spiritual talk like this and they come to know about Bhagavad Gita. And they say, hey, what is Bhagavad Gita? I want to know about it. And they go into their browser and they type B. 
And what happens? Bollywood comes up. Now they didn't want to go to Bollywood. They wanted to go to Bhagavad Gita. But what has happened? Their past choices are stored as preferences over there. And they come. So at one time, Bollywood was simply a choice that they made. They decided to go to Bollywood.com. But if they keep making that choice repeatedly, then it gets stored in the preferences of their computer, of their device. And then it comes up as an autocomplete. So similarly, lust, anger, greed, envy, these are at one level desires or emotions that we feel. But it's not all they are. If somebody repeatedly indulges in lust, suppose somebody repeatedly takes drugs, then that becomes stored as an impression in their mind. That keeps coming back, keeps coming back. So addiction means it's not just a stored preference, it's like a default page. So as soon as you click a browser, whatever be the link you have pressed, the first default page is open. So like that people who are addicted, maybe from the moment they wake up till the moment they sleep, I post about it. I want, I want, to, I want to get a shot. I want to take some drugs. So evil is basically the, I talked about these three factors which make things happen. God's will, free will and evil. So evil is basically the repeated unwanted things that people have done, which, which make the repetition of that unwanted action almost like a default action. Somebody who has taken drugs repeatedly, they don't even think, should I take this or should I, should I not take this? They just take it repeatedly. But because they are so overwhelmed, they are so, that impression has become so strong. So when things don't go in our life the way we want them to go, at that time, we are forced to get this high resolution feature. I may pray to God for help, and sometimes it seems God helps, sometimes it seems God doesn't help. So what's going on? So actually, now God is always our well-wisher. Krishna says, Surudam Sarvabhutana. He's the well-wisher of everyone. But the way he does good for us is that he helps us to use our free will properly. And the use of our free will is to counter evil. Evil is not just some dark creed, some terrorist or some ab abusers or whatever. Evil is the dark tendencies within us. And God helps those who help themselves, I would say. What that means? God's will is omnipotent. But for God's will to help us, we have to use our free will in a way that we resist evil. Not that we succumb to evil. And for doing this, this is where bhakti is extremely powerful. What bhakti does is, bhakti is the process of aligning our free will with God's will. So we can ourselves fight against evil. We might have certain unwanted habits and we say, I want to give this up, I want to give this up. And it's good to try to give it up. But no matter how many times you try to give it up, it's not so easy to give it up. So if it's we free will against evil, it's, it's tough. It's like we are in an ocean and waves are coming and we're trying to stop the waves. Sometimes the wave is small. We may not stop the wave, but we can actually stop ourselves from being swept away by the wave. Or sometimes the wave is huge. No matter how much we try, we can't stop. We get swept away. But, but if we can hold on to an anchor, that anchor will stabilize us. The waves will hit us, but the waves won't sweep us away. So our free will fighting against evil is, is um, sometimes we succeed, many other times we may not succeed. But bhakti is the process, not primarily of fighting against evil, but of aligning free will with God's will. And we, when we align our free will with God's will, then we get empowered by God. And when we are empowered by God, then we can resist evil. Internally and possibly externally also. And gradually we can bring good into our life and good into our world. We can purify ourselves, we can connect with Krishna. And ultimately, we can, by that connection with Krishna, experience life's highest happiness. So that is what the Bhagavad Gita calls us to. So God, we may not be interested in God per se. 
but we are interested in how we act in the world. So do we fulfill our potentials? Do we do we act in a way that is good for us or that is bad for us? And if you are acting in a way that is bad for us, how can we stop that? So even for functioning in the world better, now devotion to God is very important, and that's why the Bhagavad Gita concludes with Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna Yatra Partho Dhanantara Tatra Shreer Vichayo Bhute Dhruvani Tirma Tirma Ma. That if here, that if there is Arjuna and Krishna together, and, and Arjuna is what? He is Path Dhanantara. He has picked up the bow. At the start of the Bhagavad Gita, in the last verse of the first chapter, it is said that Arjuna puts aside his bow. This Rujjasasharam Japam Shokasam Vigramanasaha puts aside his bow. So Arjuna's bow represents our determination. Our determination to do our best. Sometimes life is so tough. Life is so discouraging. I quit. I just can't do it. Like we put aside our bow. But if we hear the wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita, just as Arjuna picked up his bow in readiness to fight, we also can pick up our bow. And then what the Bhagavad Gita tells us? That if the bow wielder Arjuna and the supreme mystic Krishna are together, then even the impossible becomes possible. Then victory is guaranteed. And that applies not just for Krishna and Arjuna in the battlefield of Kurukshetra, it applies for us also in our inner war against our insecurity. And if we align with Krishna, then we can overcome the evil within us and we can become better and we can make our world better. So I'll summarize what I spoke today and then if we have any questions we can discuss. I spoke on this topic of understanding how God acts in the world. I started by how we often have a low resolution picture of things. That we we, just, we don't think of a phone except as a device to send messages or take calls till the phone stops working. Same with computers, same with people. We have a transactional view of people. But only when the person doesn't do what we want them to do, what's going on? So, uh, just as we are forced by things not working to get a high resolution picture of things, to understand them in their complexity, same with life at large, same with the world at large. As long as we have certain desires and things are going more or less according to our desires, we don't think about the nature of ultimate reality. So animals never think about the ultimate reality. They just go according to their instincts for, for reproduction and survival. Humans can also do that, but humans can do more. And there are four Purusharthas traditionally considered in the Dharma Kaun, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. And their idea is that, that gradually by living harmoniously, by getting the resources and fulfilling our desires, we start realizing that fulfilling desires doesn't give fulfillment. And then we start looking for liberation, looking for a higher, higher, uh, higher level solution to life's problems. And some, so it can happen two ways. We fulfill our desires and we find that it's not fulfilling. The other is we try to fulfill our desires and we just can't fulfill our desires. Both ways, when the normal way we are functioning stops, that's when we start thinking, what is going on? So knowledge doesn't knowledge doesn't begin from God. Knowledge begins from the world. And we try to look at a higher picture of the world when things don't work in the world. Now somebody might say there is no higher resolution picture of the world. But all time, all knowledge advances by seeking a higher resolution picture. Talk science, science advances because when scientists see natural phenomena, Newton saw the fruit falling, thought maybe there's something more going on over here. What makes this fruit fall? So similarly, when things function in the world, if we think what is what makes things happen the way they do. So then we, when things don't, the things are, we are jolted in our life. It's like if somebody slaps us right now. And who are you? What are you doing? So like that, sometimes life slaps us. And we say, what's going on in my life? So at that time, when we start understanding the nature of reality, and then we talk about uh, three factors that shape actions in the world. There are, what are three factors? God's will, free will, and evil. 
So God's will is the ultimate, but we all have a given free will and we have certain freedom over which you can exercise the free will. That depends on, the magnitude of that freedom depends on our past karma. And within that, what we do is up to us. What other people do is up to them. And sometimes they can abuse that free will. And if they repeatedly abuse that free will, then the impressions that get stored within them, they are called as evil. And that evil makes them act in evil ways, even unthinkingly, shamelessly. So if we are to change ourselves, we are to create a better future for ourselves. That means that we need to use our free will, not just to overcome evil, but our free will to harmonize with God's will. Then we won't be just like trying to stop waves on our own, but we'll be holding on to an anchor by which we won't get swept away by the waves. And by the process of bhakti, when we align with God's will, then God empowers us to do many things which we ourselves may not be able to do. And God can help us to become, to make ourselves better and to make our world better. Sometimes the world's frustrations might make us quit, just like Arjuna quit at the start of the Gita. But hearing the Gita's wisdom inspired Arjuna and it can inspire us too. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Yeah, yes. I guess based upon karma and uh, his society of Brahma, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, according to his love, we get the body. Yeah. So that's actually part of the guna, right? It's part of the gunas. Okay. So your actions, your desires, the, the so called evil that you decide is really based upon your body, where which body you inhabit. Literally, you're saying, like your body in a Brahmin family. Somebody is born in a different family. Somebody has different surroundings. It doesn't do anything really work. It doesn't really fit your life. So that person actually is basically is trapped there for five days in his body, and he really can't think beyond that. Okay. So your thought of your past karma. That is why do this, don't do this, don't do this, because your karma actually is going to decide what body you're going to get. Yeah, that's a good point. Now see our past karma decides our body and bo our body to large extent shapes our reality. Yes, that's true. There are two different things over here. See, one is our past ex past can explain our emotions but our past doesn't excuse our actions. There's a difference between the two. We are products of our past but we are not prisoners of our past. So broadly speaking, you could say that there are multiple factors which shape our actions. Our past is one of them. So some people are just born, you could say, even among if somebody has many children, each child is different. Some babies, when they are when they cry, it's like they're bring, going to bring the whole house down. It's like that. Some babies, even when they're in their crib, they're thinking, when am I going to take over the house? <laughs> so each child is different. So our past definitely affects us. But along with the past, other factors are also there. There's our upbringing. Our upbringing can either reinforce our past or it can minimize the effect of the past. And beyond that, there is the association that we have. Our upbringing is also one. It's something which now the past and the upbringing we can't change. But our association we can change. And then beyond association is our free will. Sometimes some people might be in bad association, but still they can choose to act in healthy ways. And beyond it all is, is grace, is krupa. So, you know, Prabhupada would say that uh, the purpose of the Krishna consciousness movement is to make unfortunate people fortunate. What he meant is that people who might have had negative karma, people who might have had negative upbringing, if we can give them positive association, then we can change the trajectory of their lives. Yes, otherwise it's difficult to come out of the trap. So bad karma puts us in bad situations and bad situations further trigger bad karma. And that's how it becomes a trap. So, but if we can have the intercessionary grace of Krishna coming through his devotees, through devotee association, then we can be saved from the trap. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. 
okay yeah so if you have to pay the karma and you'll have ask about well, minimize by association then see the word karma is multivalent that means the word karma can mean many different things in this context we can say the past karma can refer you see karma can refer to action do your karma properly hmm? karma can also refer to reaction you know, we all have to suffer our karma karma can also refer to the system of action reaction nobody can escape the law of karma so the word karma has different meanings and oh, what are we referring to that we have to carefully understand it the every action has two reactions one is you could say physical the other is psychological just like a person who takes drugs they may they may have some 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 drugs have really bad physical reaction i just met one one lady she you know she had a son brilliant son yeah like 700 or score like in gre or something like that in sat and he got frustrated he took a heroin overdose and after that he lost everything he, he lost his intelligence he lost his capacity for mobility and last 15 years is bedridden his mother was a big executive and she has to leave her job to be a full time caretaker so you know, it's terrible sometimes the way things work out so the point i'm making here is that we do certain actions now those actions produce some external reactions that is in this case the drugs produce a the heroin put a ter terrible reaction physically but even if such physical reactions don't happen this internal consequence or internal reaction is the desire to do that becomes stronger if we do one thing the desire to do that becomes stronger so now when we are talking about karma we're talking about these two different aspects see the external consequences of our karma we could say they are large they they may be unavoidable that means if i have done some action i'll get some reaction to that but the internal consequences that is if i have done something then i feel impelled to do it again and again and again and again that internal consequence can be checked the internal consequence can be cured but sometimes when you are practicing bhakti if we expect by bhakti that the external consequences we change that that we sometimes happen that we sometimes might not happen but if we focus on practice of bhakti the internal consequences can definitely be changed and in that sense aham tvam sarupa api bhyo mokshishyam krishna says i'll free you from all sinful reactions now krishna says that i'll free you from all sinful reactions but then in the same kurukshetra war after that which happens after the bhagavad gita is spoken arjuna son of himanyu dies so then and then why did that happen did krishna not fulfill his promise so krishna's promise is ultimately that you will attain me and if any sinful reaction is going to stop you from attaining me i will protect you from that but the world is what it is even everybody even if they are devotees they are going to grow old they are going to get dizzy they are going to die so the, it is krishna's primary promises that he will protect us from our internal karmic reactions now the external karmic reaction sometimes you may protect it sometimes maybe you know, sometimes it's protecting people from the consequences of their actions is the worst thing we can do for them like somebody is just squandering money in gambling and then they their parents just cover up for it okay you lost this money i'll pay for it now what will happen their gambling addiction will increase and eventually if the parents are no longer there then because of their gambling they might be jailed they might be killed so if the parents said no you gambled now you have to pay for it you work for it you see what you'll do when, when the consequences hit we learn from that so krishna may not always protect us from the external results of our karma but the internal results he will always protect yeah that desire will be will be cleansed of that desire okay thank you very much yeah one last question okay okay yeah 
okay so how do we anchor uh, align our free will in god, god's will see broadly we could say that consider two circles a circle of things we like to do a circle of things that is good that are good for us if these two circles would be identical life would be so nice isn't it <laughs> but these two circles are not necessarily entirely non intersect so find out where the two intersect what is it that we like to do and what is it that is also good for us so if we like music and then we have spiritual music so spiritual things are good for us music is we lot like to do then we connect with spiritual music more and more so so if we find something in the intersection of those two circles that can become our anchor very easily if it's something something simply which we like to do when when we are when we are agitated we may not uh, the like things which we like to do may not be good for us and sometimes it's things which are simply good for us if we are told to do them but if we don't like them then it may just become too much of austerity and we feel like i can't do this so we may have to do those things also but especially when we are agitated we can't start doing those things immediately so we need to be in the in, in the intersection so there we can find our anchor and from that anchor when we connect with it we develop our relationship with krishna by that get a taste for krishna then gradually other things also become more easily doable okay so thank you very much shrimad bhagavad gita ki krishna prabhu pad ki gaur bhakt bindaki gaur premanande